Our, our final speaker for today is, as I've mentioned several times, and we're still on, we're still on track for that, uh, Senator Larry Campbell, who is uh, a, senate, a, 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 a senator in the Canadian Parliament, uh, among all the other things that he has done. And he has on um, his character, or the character modeled on him in Da Vinci's Inquest, uh, sometimes makes disparaging comments about the drug policy south of the border. <laughs> Which is, of course, the United States. Um, welcome, Larry Campbell. Thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, there was a significant fall in attendance um, because some people wanted to be outside and listen. For those that are outside, I'm doing this speech naked and the door is now locked. <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot get back in. This also points to the fact that if I was organizing this conference, I would have Reverend Sanders speak at the end uh, to hold everybody, because I can guarantee you that never once in my speaking life has anybody ever said amen while I'm speaking, except when I say I'm finished now. <clears throat> um, it's great to be here. Um, I was saying to Ethan, I, when I, I come to these, by the end of the day, my head hurts um, because there's so many, uh, so many different issues and so many different statistics coming at me that I'm not really sure uh, exactly what's going on. Um, by way of background, um, I, I'm from Ontario originally. Um, I started my life after high school as a, uh, I dug ditches for coaxial cable in Ontario. Um, I'm sure there are parents here that understand uh, what I speak of. You know what, my son turned 20 and I said, so are you gonna get a job? And he said, well, I, I don't know. And I said, he said, well, what did grandpa say? I said, well, it was the day after Labor Day. I was laying in bed, I'd finished high school. Grandpa came in and said, you know, are you gonna get a job? And I said, I was gonna look for one. He dropped a pair of Greb Kodiaks, pair of leather gloves and said, don't worry about it, I found you one. And I spent the next, next year digging ditches. My son's comment was, man, that was harsh, eh? So, you know, I'm sure that people can equate with this. I then became a steel worker. That tired pretty quickly. I was a hand riveter in a boxcar plant in Hamilton. Uh, I joined the Royal Canadian Mounted Police on a bet uh, because uh, another friend of mine had been a police officer and he suggested that I join the Hamilton Municipal Police Force, which was seen as lower than the Ontario Provincial Police Force. So I joined the Mounties and they took me. Um, I spent about three years in uniform. Um, I wasn't really good on traffic. I didn't like giving out tickets. Um, they eventually transferred me to drug squad. I went in Vancouver. Uh, I worked street crew, which is uh, street enforcement, basically uh, chasing down heroin addicts, uh, squeezing them and working your way up the ladder, passing them off to the next, the next group of people. I also did undercover, uh, heroin mainly, uh, and a lot of uh, cell jobs. Um, I started a drug squad in Langley, which was a small town. Uh, as you realize that, uh, that Vancouver, in fact, is only about 750,000 people, but Metro is close to two million, so it's, it's sort of a broad area. Uh, after 12 years of that, um, and I really enjoyed being a Mountie. I never thought of myself as a drug warrior, and I have to tell you that now. I thought of myself as a police officer uh, who was enforcing the law. That, that was all there was to it. I never got personal about it. I never got nudgy. That's, that's the way it went. I also have to tell you that I've never laid a marijuana charge, ever. It was just like too much work, uh, pour it out, watch them cry, but you know, I just didn't get into that. Um, I got a call from the chief coroner one day while I was a Mountie, and he'd been my inspector. He asked me if I would consider applying for the job of Vancouver coroner. And I should tell you, coroner in Canada is not a medical, in, at least in British Columbia, is not a medical examiner. It's somebody who can investigate, somebody who can, I sit as a Supreme Court judge when I'm holding an inquest, and somebody who can move towards finding out the truth. I told him I was doing great in the Mounties. He told me that I should quit. I'm going to jail because there's now a Charter of Rights in Canada and everything that I'm really good at is illegal. 
wiretapping, surreptitious entries, <laughs> pretending I'm somebody that I'm not while I get a confession, you know, the usual stuff that really made life good. And so on a Friday, <laughs> On a Friday, I left the Mounted Police and I became a coroner on the Monday. And I stayed with the coroner service for 20 years. Uh, I retired as the chief coroner for the province. It was an interesting process that I went through because one day I was out enforcing the law and then on the next Monday, um, it was my responsibility to figure out why people died. And I didn't really care about the law anymore. It wasn't important to me. What was important to me was why did these people die and how can I possibly change the way we're doing things to ensure that they don't die? And of course, you know, the majority of my cases involved motor vehicle accidents, deaths in hospitals. I gotta tell you, Vancouver, we average 28 homicides a year. That's it. Sometimes it goes up, like we had a, a spike, but it was almost all gang related. It went up to, I think, 38. But as a matter of course, over all those 20 years, it was about 28. So. Uh, you know, it's not very many, you know, for a city that size. Um, and getting involved in how do you keep people alive, I suddenly, you know, in the 80s, and, and the Reverend will understand this, suddenly I started to see young men dying. Didn't know why, showed nothing at the autopsy, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, but nothing. And of course, this was the start of HIV. And Vancouver was especially hard hit because Vancouver is a community that embraces everybody. Uh, we don't have homophobia. We, we sort of celebrate the fact that everybody is from, there is no such thing as a Canadian. I mean, we're from, I'm from Scotland. My, my grandparents, you know, people are from China. And we embrace that. But this started a terrific, uh, a terrific movement in Vancouver. It started in the gay community because of the HIV. It rapidly, the HIV rapidly spread into the intravenous drug user, and we started seeing just an incredible rise in deaths. And as we went along, we were able to recognize what was, what was the cause of this and start treating it. But the, the having to get involved with the, the intravenous drug user sort of changed my life. Um, I'd, I'd done all, almost all my drug work in the downtown east side. Now the downtown east side, for those of you who do watch Da Vinci's Inquest, is where everything is set. And it's probably a 10 block area uh, from Insight, which I'll describe later. So it's about 10 blocks in any direction. And within that, that area is about 5,000 intravenous drug users. And this downtown east side has always been thus. It was Skid Road, which when we dragged logs uh, in the early days of Vancouver, they called it the Skid Road because they would skid the logs up the main drag and, and take them to the mill. And it was an incredible community. And it is an incredible community. It's the heart of Vancouver. It's where the acceptance of people goes beyond your comprehension. Um, it's a place where you can go when you're having trouble and people won't make fun of you. It's where most of our mentally ill went after we shut down the mental institutions. And so it's quite an incredible place. But in the 90s, we started to see an incredible increase in drug deaths. You know, we, we peaked at a probably a couple of hundred in Vancouver. Now at one point, I remember going to a, a scene and there were two people dead. They hadn't even got the needle out of their arm. And I was talking, you know, I was continually talking to the drug squad and police, and, and none of us knew what was going on, mainly because we didn't do things like make a seizure and then test it because it had to go to court. I mean, we wouldn't spend the money to go out and just make a seizure and say, okay, what is this? When we finally got it analyzed, it was running at about 99%. It was pure heroin. It was coming straight off the boat. Whereas when I was on the, the street, like a 15% cap would be a hot cap. I mean, you'd die from that. We saw all this going on, and it's centered in the downtown east side because that's where the people who used heroin lived. <coughs> mayor Philip Owen, one day, he'd been mayor for, oh, probably, well, two terms at that point. He was going into his third term. One day, he was standing at the corner of Hastings and Maine, and he realized that the city of Vancouver, the police, the coroner, everybody, had abandoned the downtown east side. It, 
there was things going on there that you wouldn't allow in any other neighborhood. Old people were, it wasn't that it was dangerous. People have this idea that it's dangerous and people kill each other down there. It's not so. It's not so. It's unsightly. It's messy. The people who are walking around are sometimes homeless, most certainly poverty, and probably have some form of addiction problems. So Phil Pullen said, okay, I'm gonna do something about this. And so he got a person named Donald McPherson who became our drug czar, not like your drug czar. I had the opportunity to meet a couple of your drug czars. They're not near as nice as Donald McPherson and certainly not as understanding when it comes to drug policy. And they started holding meetings and they knew from the very start that these had to be wide open, that there was no barriers. Come one, come all. And they would go every night and they would go into all of the different communities and there would be drug users, there would be police officers, there would be right wing, there would be left wing, there would be everybody. And it, I, it was the most entertaining event in town. I mean, you couldn't pay to go to see a movie that was better than this because they would just be yelling and Philip would be trying to slow them down. In the end, Philip and Donald and all of these people got together and they establish what's known as the four pillars. And we've seen the four pillars here. It's modeled, we stole it from the Swiss. Canadians will steal it from you if it's a good idea, I swear to God, we'll take it. <laughs> and the four pillars are harm reduction, treatment, law enforcement, and prevention. Now, I was nearing, and, and once we started into this process, and once we started into understanding what was going on in the drug scene, the police were going out and saying, step on it. Don't, don't take your, your uh, drugs pure. I mean, this, the police were saying, step on it. This was sort of the start. Now, to go back a bit, the mayor before Philip Owen became the premier of our province, and he started the first needle exchange in Canada. Uh, it baffles me. It just totally baffles me every time I see uh, the, your government saying, uh, you can't have needle exchanges uh, because it'll cause addiction. It's like flies causing garbage. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's just so ridiculous that, you know, it's like, how do grown people, how do they, how do they, what do they all get together here? You know, they're the ones that are probably doing the brownies and seeing the shine, you know, they'd have to be. So we already had in place our needle exchange and we then added condoms to that and then we end added street nurses to that. And so we were moving towards that and we, we got the harm reduction started. And a big part of that is sitting right here, uh, my dad, Nathan, um, who, <laughs> who whenever it looked like Vancouver was starting to cool <laughs> off a bit would come in and poke the embers and the fires would start rising again and we'd go back at it. Philip Owen's party decided that they didn't like four pillars. And so they told the mayor, this is the three-term mayor, that if he wanted to run, he'd have to go through a nomination process. His feelings were very hurt because he'd been with this party for over 25 years. He decided he wasn't going to run. I'd retired as chief coroner, and I belonged to a group called Opening the Doors. And it was just a bunch of people. We had drug addicts and nurses and doctors and citizens, and we'd get together once a month, and we'd, over coffee, we'd talk about the four pillars and how it's gonna go. And so they said, you know, you gotta go talk to, to Philip, and you gotta get him to run. So I went and talked to Philip, said, you know, you gotta run. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll run as a counselor, and we'll run independent. Um, he said no, that he couldn't do that. So I went back and reported to the group, and they said, they looked at each other and said, well, then you're gonna have to run because you're the only guy that doesn't have a job here. You know, now I was, I was really quite enjoying life, okay? I have to admit there was a little heat coming from home because I wasn't going to work every day. So I thought, okay, so I'll run for it, you know? And when I lose, I'll go into a deep depression. And it can only be cured by fly fishing and, and laying on the beach. And it's gonna take me three or four years to get out of this. <clears throat> um, I ran, and um, I ran with a party that, I have to tell you, at first I didn't realize they were communists. I swear to God, 
When I went to the first fundraiser, something should have twigged when I saw that they were selling old linen pins to raise money. In any event, we ran 26 candidates for mayor, council, park board, and school board. We elected 26 candidates. For the first time ever, a right-wing party was not running the city of Vancouver, and we were. And I gotta tell you, it was very scary. It was very scary. I'd never gone to mayor school, and so I wasn't sure what. But the interesting thing is we ran on a platform that we would open the first supervised injection site in North America. 26 of us got elected. It wasn't like I snuck up on them. It wasn't like I didn't run on this. It wasn't like I said, oh, we're not going to do that, and then boom. We ran on it. Every meeting, I said, this is what we're going to do, and this is why we've got to do it. If that's my mom. Tell her I'm speaking right now, okay? <laughs> um, this did not go well, down well with the, the drug czar, uh, Mr. Waters. And I remember I hadn't even been sworn in yet. I was with Philip, and we were going into a, a board of trade meeting where Mr. Waters was going to speak, and he started whispered to me, you know, if you open that supervised injection site, you could have border problems. I said, yeah, and L.A. could be in the dark and thirsty. <laughs> and we just walked in, and we smiled at each other, shook a hand, and, you know. And that was the first time that I really realized that little old me could be a threat to big old you. And in fact, a friend of mine from the DEA, and I have a number of friends who are DEA because I work together with them, I, I said, you know, I'm really worried about getting into the states. And he said, you're not worried about getting into the states. You've got to worry about getting out of the states. That's, that's the thing you should be worried about. Now, for the insight, for those that aren't familiar with it, there are some notions you've got to get rid of. It's not a honeypot, OK? I don't score in New Westminster and get on the SkyTrain and come into Vancouver so I can shoot up. That's not how drugs work. Here's how drugs work. I score, I'm scared but witless, I'm afraid of the police, I'm afraid of the dealer, other junkies are trying to rip me off, so the minute I get that, I'm shooting it up. And if it's mud, a muddy puddle that I'm using, so be it. And believe me, I've seen lots of people fixing using that. It's not that at all. People don't wake up one day, and somebody was, somebody, I think it was earlier on today, was talking about uh, injection sites, and it would make people become addicts. Oh yeah, like you get up in the morning and say, wow, we got insight now. I think I'll be a junkie. <laughs> it makes no sense. It makes no sense. But these are the arguments that go on. I think that insight has become a, the, the pointed end of the spear. And it shouldn't, because insight is just one tool. And it's not even that big a tool. If you don't have a mass, a critical mass of injectors, you don't need insight. You don't, like every town doesn't need insight. Every town doesn't have that. If you have them, then it's just one, one little tool. Now, unfortunately, the liberals got defeated. Oh, I should also tell you, I was gonna, uh, there was a quote from uh, Rick Steves last night. I'm the same as he is. Remember how he said, that he is an independent writer and somebody, nobody has to tell him what to do or that he can be fired. I'm exactly the same way. I'm a senator, I'm appointed to age 75. Unless I threaten the queen, <laughs> nothing's gonna happen to me, okay? They can't fire me. And this is the problem with politics. As long as you gotta get elected, you gotta be careful what you say, although I didn't as mayor. And it worked. I don't know whether it works all the time. But I can tell you when you're not elected and they can't tell you what to say. The only argument is whether they want you to stay in the party or leave the party. And in my case, they decided it would be better to keep me in the tent than to have me outside the tent throwing rocks back into it. <laughs> so Rick and I are sort of you know, the, same, the same thing. I can tell you that insight has been referred, and this is in 2006, the White House Office of National Drug Policy, quote, that Insight was state-sponsored suicide. <laughs> Not to be outdone, our health minister, Mr. Clement, called the Insight an abomination that allowed and encouraged people to inject. 
Now, these are not stupid people. Where do they get these ideas? Where does all of this come from? Well, to go further on insight, I'll just give you some facts. In one year, we have 276,000 visits, 702 visits a day, 5,447 unique users, 484 overdose, never had a death. Think of that. Close to 800 injections every day, seven days a week since 2003. We have never had a death. People have overdosed. But within that clinic, and if you can imagine it, you walk in through the door, and there's eight stations with mirrors in front of them. And beside the station is uh, um, pure water, a clean syringe, a tie-off, a kidney bowl to put it all in. And you inject there. And behind you are standing registered nurses. So if you go down, they're there. You go down in an alley, they're not there. You go down in a single room occupancy, they're not there. The use of detox centers has increased. The, reduce of the reduction of public, or I'm sorry, of injecting publicly decreased. Needle sharing, down. Addiction treatment, because now we've gone, you know, we started with, started with this just little insight. We've now added a detox upstairs, and we've now added treatment. So if you go in there, once you inject, from there you go and the nurse sees you. And so if you have a scrape, or as we get lots of abscesses, they treat you there. The costs at the emergency at St. Paul's Hospital have dropped so significantly that when they did a study, they figured it was good for about a net saving of $18 million because these people don't have to go there. We, ha we've, we figured that over the years, we've saved 1,175 lives. One, is, one person dying is too many. The overdoses in the area dropped 35% versus the city as a whole where the overdoses have dropped 9%. It's been estimated that yearly, we stop 35 cases of HIV, three of which would result in death, and another societal benefit of $6 million. Now, I'd like to tell you that Canada, you know, we're on a march that we're leading the world. Um, unfortunately, that's not true. Because now, as of last week, and it just passed in the Senate, we stayed up until some ungodly hour. Of course, at my age, anything after nine is pretty much ungodly. <laughs> We passed a law, it's called an omnibus bill. It says if you grow six plants and you're convicted of possession for the purpose, you're going to get six months in jail. In my statement, I said, you know, if you're a dealer and you're only growing six plants, you're either stupid or lazy. <laughs> I don't know anybody that grows six plants for profit. And I live on Galliano Island, home of the best PC, but I'm told <laughs> in the world it would be like an embarrassment to get popped with six plants. <laughs> not only that, not only that, but as I pointed out in my speech to the Conservative government, you're going to give me six months for six plants, and you're going to give me a deuce less for a thousand. Hmm, another year and a half. It's about I figured somewhere around $97,000 in my jeans if I do the 100,000 versus the six plants. Guess what? I'm going to grow 1,000 plants. That's a significant grow up. Man, you got a, something going on for 1,000 plants. So there's a, an incentive here, if you're going to get into this, that you might as well go and do provincial time and make some money while you're at it. Now, we couldn't get any amendments to this bill. We, the only amendment we could get was they thought it important that Canadian citizens who have been victims of terror are allowed to sue the terrorist organizations. <laughs> I think that's a great idea, and, and I certainly, if I was a victim of terrorism, I would want to get even, big time. But I got a feeling that you're not going to get much money out of Al-Qaeda. <laughs> and my... my my whole thing is this versus this, where people are going to jail, where, where you know, it's affecting our society. 
Now, lest you think that racism is dead in Canada, let me assure you that our Aboriginal population suffers in exactly the same way as the minority populations do in the United States. Virtually identical. They, have, they represent maybe 10, 15% of the population and they're 35 to 40% of our prison population. Nobody, nobody can tell me that there is not racism going on when you see figures like that. And for anybody to even deny it, again, they're doing brownies somewhere. There's just no question about it. See, I'm a pragmatic person. I'm neither left nor right. I will steal a good idea no matter where it is on the political spectrum. But it has to be a good idea. And a bad law is a bad law and should not be blindly followed. There is such a thing as decent civil unrest where you just simply say, I'm not going to do this. And so when we got insight, the federal government took us to the Supreme Court of British Columbia. We won. They then took us to the Appeal Court of British Columbia. We won. They then took us to the Supreme Court of Canada, and we won. Regardless of that, they would never, they'd have to, they put me in jail. They would not shut down insight. And I told them repeatedly, I said that publicly, morally, I could not stand by and watch you kill people. And that's exactly what was going on. So now we're seeing Montreal's talking about insight, Montreal's, you know, talking about going that way. <coughs> Legalization is not, should not be just an idea that we talk about. It makes common sense. If it didn't make common sense, if insight didn't work, if insight didn't give me these results, scientific, peer-reviewed, I'd have shut it down because I'm not going to waste money. I'm not going to, I'm not Don Quixote, and I will not take my lance to those towers. And the problem that we keep hearing time and time again is statements that are thrown out as fact, as peer-reviewed, as the truth, when in fact, they're none of those things. Scientific and peer-reviewed is the gold standard for me. It's the gold standard because it means that I just can't say something and everybody accepts it. I have to put it out there to my peers who may or may not agree with me and they have to decide whether this is good science. And if all we ever did was follow good science, we wouldn't find ourselves in, in the type of situations we find ourselves in. Six months in jail for six plants. I mean, it's not gonna happen. I mean, we were cops. Would you waste your time on six plants? I don't think so. I mean, just trying to find enough evidence to get the guy for possession. What do you got to do? You know? It's not good science. Now, if I, I usually go for the warm, fuzzy side. You know, like I got into keeping people alive. I really liked it. I enjoyed it. It gave me great satisfaction. It allowed me, you know, to drive through my city and say, you know what? I had that guardrail put up so cars didn't go up over the, the curb and kill somebody. And we had three or four people killed in the same spot before finally we had this. I was, able to, I was able to say to myself, you know, I'm proud of that. I like that. And that's why when we take a look at this, we don't even have to, you know, the, the war on drugs has failed. It, it, it never had a chance of winning. It couldn't possibly win because it's all ideological. It's all ideological. And when all you ever do is support your arguments with ideology, it can't stand the scientific test. It simply can't do it. Now, I went to Switzerland. I have to tell you that I wasn't in favor of injection sites. Probably for the six months run up to uh, to the election, I, I, I couldn't get it through my head. I, I couldn't, you know, I just couldn't get my head around it. It seemed counterintuitive to me. And finally, uh, somebody who's very, you know, very dear to me, um, who was uh, an addict, s sat me down and said, Here's, here are the facts. And the facts were again put, put out by science. But in, st in top of that, I went to Zurich. Now, like, you know, th there is nothing more anal than Swiss people. It's just, it's just not possible. 
So when I went there to discuss this with them, I said, you know, I want to talk about the drug problem. They said, we don't have a drug problem. We have a drug nuisance. <laughs> okay, it's a nuisance. It's unsightly. You know, it gives us, it was like somebody talking about, you know, having somebody blowing a joint in front of the cathedral and burn or whatever. You know, it's just unsightly. It's not, and so they showed me what they did. And so I went to the supervised injection site, right? And I expect to see all of these wild people running around. No, no, they're just sitting there having a coffee, cigarette, very civilized. I'm a cigarette, so I'm very civilized. They have an inhale, inhalation room. So you go have a cigarette, coffee, guys are doing laundry. People are over there, they're injecting with nurses. There's people over there that are doing cocaine. And when they come out, they get counseling and they're talked to and all the rest of it. I'm like, this is pretty good. But what really sold me on this, what really got me, was they told me they had a mobile supervised injection site to deal with sex trade workers. And they told me that they set it up and nobody came. This really, nobody came. So they went to the sex trade workers and said, why didn't you come? And the sex trade workers told them that there was a dark spot between the stroll and where this mobile injection site was. And the sex trade workers considered this dangerous. So they moved the mobile site right over here off and running. It's all, this idea that people, this will cause more drugs or that people will come to there is crazy. I can show you the statistics that the people who use Insight are within that 10 block radius. In fact, probably within a five to six block radius. So this idea that it, you know, people will gather and come to the new supervised injection site just is simply crazy. I read the Houston Chronicle yesterday. The good news, the editorial was amazing. I love the editorial. It's all supportive. Then I read, the private prison industry wants to take over all the prisons in the United States, and they will save you money. But guess what? You've got to guarantee them a 90% occupancy rate. <laughs> I'm like, man. If I owned Howard Johnson's, I'd get into this thing, okay? 90% a night, okay, so we don't have quite a fancy setting as they do. This is outrageous. It's outrageous. And I'm telling you, we're going to see it in Canada. Just as the small towns here in, in the United States were vying for this because it brings jobs, exactly the same thing's happening in Canada. Now, the, pre the, the federal government says, don't worry. Uh, it won't be that big an increase. Yeah, well, guess what? You're not doing federal time. You're doing provincial time. And all these provincial attorneys general just woke up and somebody blew a 70 to $100 million hole in their budget without even building anything and we're already double bunking. This, you know, I, I'd like to say to you, Canada's going the opposite direction. We're about 10 years behind you guys all the time. You elect conservatives, we elect liberals. You elect Democrats, we elect conservatives. It's like, can't we ever get together on this thing? <laughs> this is a serious problem. For this even to be reported, I couldn't believe I was reading this. You guarantee us a 90% occupancy rate. Aren't we supposed to be trying to keep people out of jails? <laughs> Aren't we supposed to be... Whatever happened to helping people? Oh, you, you go to jail, we're going to give you a trade. Forget it. Yeah. Forget it. It never happens. The only good thing about Canada, at least, you know what, after five years, I can get rid of my record. And even if I have it, like, our prisoners vote. It's human rights. You get to vote just because you're in jail doesn't mean you don't have an opinion. So we set up a poll in the, in the prisons. I mean, here, you've got it. You're dead meat. I, I had no idea. I mean, you are officially dead meat. If I had a record here, I would leave the country and go somewhere else and start all over again. Yeah. Because you can't possibly do it here. <laughs> prohibition, if you didn't, hadn't learned from the 30s about prohibition, you must have your head in the sand. If this is an, a scientifically proved, peer-reviewed, this is what happened, this is how the gangs got going, this is how they made their money, and we're doing it again, where's the common sense? You know, families, communities, economies, they're all, they're all getting blown up by this. 
They're all getting blown up. When, you know, when I listen to the professor on Jim Crow, I mean, I'm like, I'm heartbroken. I mean, I'm, I'm totally heartbroken. I had, I had no idea. I knew it was bad, but I had no idea it was as bad as that. And when are we going to learn from what other people do? Is, none of us, not a single person here says, you know what? I want my kids to try drugs. I smoke. I, I, my son doesn't smoke. I'd break his hands if he smoked. I drink. He doesn't drink because I took him fishing when he was 15, let him get drunk with the rats on the dock, then took him out fishing the next day. <laughs> I was crying because it was hurting so bad. But he doesn't drink anymore. And when he was in high school, he was the most popular kid around because he didn't drink and he had a car. So he got to go to all the parties, have all the fun, and he was popular. When are we going to learn from the Netherlands? Nobody here is saying take drugs. Nobody's saying take marijuana, take ecstasy, take any of these. But all we're saying is you've got to know about it. You've got to be informed on it. And we have to act on it in a way that is prudent, in a way that shows us as a society. Can anybody tell me how interdiction has worked? Now, I heard today about supply driving demand. <laughs> I got an MBA. I didn't do real well in economics, I got to tell you, OK? But I have to tell you this. I looked it up. And there is a small number of economists out there who believe that supply drives demand. They're the same ones that believe, according to the Mayan calendar, we're toast 21st of December, OK? <clears throat> And if we are toast, you can say, I told you so. I'll be on the island, Galliano Island, OK, because we're going to be OK there. <laughs> How can this possibly be that interdiction works? When I was a Maui, if we seized a pound of heroin, we'd rush down to Oppenheimer Park, and we'd watch to see what happened. And if it was a local pound that we seized, you would start to see the addicts go through the DTs, because there was nothing on the street. You could see them. It dried up. I remember when I was chief coroner, they, they, they got 20 kilos of heroin. The next day, the death rate went up. Interdiction is, it's numbers. You heard about the warehouse. You know, it, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Um, there's an increase in all of the supplies. There is no problem with the supply end. It's the demand end that we have to start taking care of. And the demand end is here, is in your country. And I'm not going to get into all the, Nathan and I were down in Mexico for three days at a conference. I mean, it's scary what these people are having to deal with, what the citizens are having to deal with. But it's all about the supply. You know, I got an idea. Why don't we buy all of the heroin that's produced in Afghanistan? Pay the farmer whatever he pays, whatever he gets paid, and just let him keep growing. That's what he's good at. That's what grows good. And we keep it. And we use it for medicine. And we start considering heroin maintenance. In Vancouver, we had what's called the Naomi trials. Okay? We had 100 people who were getting methadone, 100 people who were getting heroin. Guess what? The 100 people who were getting heroin, after one year, healthy. We found them homes. They were ready to go to work. A few of them said, I don't know what I'm doing this for. Exactly as somebody said here, why am I going through this? And yet there was still a lot of people that thought, this is wrong. We're, we're giving them. We're giving them drugs. Do you care if I'm an addict and I spend all afternoon stoned watching Oprah? I'm not out selling my body. I'm not out stealing. I'm not out worrying about where I'm getting my next fix. I'm not worried about getting chased. And you know what? Once you take those pressures out of this addiction, this addiction model, suddenly you have people who finally are able to step back and take a look at their lives and say, I've got to change. But you can't do it when you're in the scramble. Not a single documented case of death from marijuana. 
Not a single documented case. And yet, we're treating this like it's the biggest deal since sliced bread. <laughs> it's not. It's not, I mean, you know, just imagine if everybody who smoked marijuana, this gateway drug, actually became addicted. Man, we wouldn't have any friends. Everybody we know, everybody I know. Okay, not everybody. Okay, not everybody. But the majority of people I know have at some point in time tried this. Some of them have continued to use it. Admittedly, they ended up becoming lawyers. But, you know, I don't, I don't think you should hold that against them. This is the myth that's being perpetrated when it comes to marijuana. In a perfect world, we wouldn't have it. In a perfect world, we wouldn't have alcohol, we wouldn't have drugs. We don't live in a perfect world. We live in a real world. And we have to start addressing this as a real world problem. Imagine, it was, it, I almost wept at that professor, imagine a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars. Imagine what could have been done with that. I mean, it, it just boggles my mind. There's a reason. There's a reason why we go onto Indian reserves and they're living in substandard housing, bad sewage, unemployment. We keep them there. We absolutely keep them there. Instead of saying, you know what, this is not Canada, we keep them there. And it doesn't matter whether you're a liberal or a conservative. It doesn't matter. Because you know what? They aren't us. That's, the, that's how it happens. They aren't us. And so we really have to start going at this. And we've had people say, yeah, OK, if we legalize it, we've got to start thinking about ABC. Of course we do. We're just not going to legalize something and then not have in place, how do, we, you know, how do we deal with this? I can tell you that I have the trademark for BC Bud, OK? So, <laughs> you know, and Nathan's working on the Acapulco Gold. We'll have her all wrapped up. If I could just get the leaves to turn red like our flag, I'm on a, I'm on a roll. Of course, there's going to be problems. But the problems that are over there don't even come close to comparing to what we're doing over here with prisons, with marginalizing people. So we got to sit down and figure out how we do this. We can do that. It's not a problem. But we've got to move to that. I'm going to close with this. You know what? The federal government does diddly. Nothing. Ignore them. All of the good stuff comes from the province, in your case, the state, or from the cities, the big cities. You get the big cities going with you, and all of this is going to go smoothly. But the feds will never, ever move on this. I thought, I thought man, when you guys got Clinton, I'm like, all right. <laughs> no. <laughs> George, what can I say? There's no surprises there. When you got Obama, I thought, all right, here's a guy that's good. No. It's going to come exactly as the people from the drug organization said. It's going to come from the states. It's going to come from an overwhelming uprising of, you know what, we aren't playing this game anymore. We are not going to pay, pay out all of these expenses from our tax money. We don't believe that it's a problem. If it is a problem, the problem is the prohibition, not the use of. And it will extend. In Switzerland, they told me, for heroin addiction, there's a continuum of care. There's 10% on this end that can do the 12 steps. And there's 10 to 15% on this end that there's nothing you can do, that you've got to go to heroin maintenance. We should be considering that. We should be looking at that. That's how we go about getting ourselves out of this mess. I don't know how much time. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm over. In any event, I, I thank you for be, having me here. Um, I've never been to Houston. I've never seen a cowboy boot that big in the Zaza Hotel. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes,
difference, difference lies. Yeah, you know that. Sure. Well, just as Larry figured it's not good to, to, to follow uh, Edwin Sanders, uh, I'm not going to try to recap the day and say, <laughs> pull out the wisdom from every part. I, I do want to say, well, just a bit of bookkeeping. Those are, again, to remind you that if you're getting CEU credit, you'll need to be sure and, and sign for that as, as, you, as you leave today. Um, I want to thank again our contributors who, made, who, who uh, contributed toward the expenses for this conference. I particularly want to thank the, the staff here at the Baker Institute. Um, they do a wonderful job. <laughs> Whether it's arranging for the, for the travel of everybody and having, and I, I, I come in to Melissa Llewellyn, whom you've seen out there, and I say, have you thought of it? Yes, we got that taken care of. <laughs> How about this? Here's a list. <laughs> you know, uh, do you? Yes, I've done that. <laughs> that that's wonderful. Or this morning when uh, you were here, and I, I said, there's a slide I'd like to show you. Boom, there it was, you know. There, there, it is such a pleasure to, to, to work here. Um, and, I want, and I want to um, encourage you, if you're not already part of the Baker Institute, if you'd like to be, uh, keep, put, us on, put us on your, check the Baker Institute for what we do. Many of the things are just by invitation. Often you can sort of come anyway. But uh, <laughs> we're not trying to drive people away, actually. But uh, it's, it's, uh, this is a very exciting place for me to, to just sit here, have an office, and have much of the world come by at, at, a, at an excellent level. And of course, I want to, to thank our speakers, uh, who many who've come long distances uh, with modest requirements and have given us everything I hoped for. Uh, it has been a I'm really glad this time has come. <laughs> By which I mean four o'clock today. <laughs> but but, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm even more glad that we had such a wonderful day. Thank all of you for coming and come back again. Oh, thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs>